the story of the Three Sieges of Newark. Before I talk about the Three Sieges of Newark, I need to tell you what a siege is. A siege is a form of fighting where an army attacks a town, a city, or a big house, or a castle. And the people living in the city, the town, the castle, or the big house fight back. That's a siege. There were lots of sieges in the British Civil Wars. In fact, there were more sieges than battles. And Newark had three sieges. It's a little bit greedy, but they did. Before I start talking about the sieges and all the fighting and all the gory death and destruction, let me tell you who the two sides were in the war and why people were fighting over Newark. The two sides in the British Civil War were the Royalists, who were fighting for King Charles I, and we also call them Cavaliers, and the other side were the Parliamentarians, who were fighting for, um, oh yeah, Parliament, and we call them the Roundheads. Newark was Cavalier. In fact, it was the only Cavalier town in the East Midlands during the Civil War. All, all, all the towns around it were Roundhead. Apart from Lincoln, but we don't really count Lincoln because they were cavalier for about two seconds and then they got thrashed by the Roundheads and were captured by the Roundheads and remained under Roundhead control for the rest of the war. Newark was very important. And the reason it was very important is because it had two very important roads going through it. One road was called the Great North Road, which started in Scotland and ended up in London. And the other road was an old Roman road that was still in use and it was called the Foss Way, and that started in Exeter and ended up in Lincoln. Now, why are roads so important? Well, they're important because in the 17th century, when the Civil War took place, most roads were rubbish. And if you had some good roads, especially two roads that crisscrossed each other halfway through the country in Newark, then you could march all your soldiers up and down them and transport all your weapons and your gold and your supplies, etc., etc., so if you've got hold of Newark, like the Cavaliers did, you want to keep it. And if you haven't got it, like the Roundheads didn't, you want to capture it. So, my friends, that's all the boring technical stuff out of the way. Let's get down to talking about the fighting. That's what you're really here for, isn't it? The fighting sort of started in late 1642, the first year of the Civil War, when a bunch of Roundheads turned up to have a bit of a look at Newark and see if they could just go into Newark and, and just raid it and nick some stuff and burn some stuff and maybe kill some people. The Roundheads I'm talking about weren't really an army. They were more like a sort of raiding party. And Newark at that point in the war, despite everything I've already said about how important it was, didn't have very many soldiers. And the few soldiers it did have were borrowed by King Charles I to fight a battle somewhere in Warwickshire. But that didn't make a difference to the people that were in Newark, you know, the normal people of Newark. And I'll tell you why, because the people of Newark are pretty hard. They are now, and they were back then. And so someone, when they knew that the Roundheads were coming, banged a drum in the market square, and that was a sort of call for people to come out and grab whatever weapons they could, normally things that you would use to sort of work on a farm or in the field, and march out to meet the Roundheads at the bottom of a place called Beacon Hill. Well, the Roundhead soldiers squared off against the normal, but pretty hard people from Newark. And guess what happened? The Roundheads turned round and walked away. They didn't fight. They just turned round and walked away. And to this day, no one really knows why they did it. They came back a few months later with an army this time, 6,000 soldiers and a bunch of cannons. But Newark had got its soldiers back, about a 1,000 of them. And so siege number one was on. Siege number one took place in late February 1643, and it lasted a day and a half. Now, for a siege to last a day and a half, it means one of the two sides is being particularly rubbish. And do you think it was Newark? Absolutely not. No, I've, we've already established that Newark are hard as nails. It was the Roundheads. They made lots of mistakes, like um, putting their cannons too far away to actually hit anything. And when they attacked Newark... Well, Newark had the, the nerve, the cheek, to actually fight back and attack them. And guess what the Roundheads did? They dropped their weapons and they ran away. It was all their leader's fault, you know. Major General Thomas Ballard, who was so bad at giving orders and making decisions and gave up so quickly after one day's appalling fighting that people to this day think he was secretly a cavalier. He certainly had lots of cavalier friends in the East Midlands and, 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 and may have had some friends in Newark at the time. Or he could have just been really, really rubbish. We'll, we'll never really know. Let's move on. 
In between sieges one and two, Newark got a visit from royalty, not King Charles I, but his wife, Queen Henrietta Maria. Queen Henrietta Maria had just come back from a trip round Europe. Charles I had sent her there and he'd instructed her to take all of her expensive jewellery and borrow a load of money against the value of the jewellery and go and hire soldiers, foreign soldiers, fear soldiers from lots of different countries that we call mercenaries. So Queen Henrietta Maria hired four and a half thousand foreign soldiers. I mean, these were French soldiers, Irish soldiers, Dutch soldiers and some German soldiers, packed them all onto boats and sailed these boats around the north of England. She was nearly drowned in a storm and, and then the roundhead navy chased them all the way to Bridlington and then Queen Henrietta Maria and her army got out. They were shot out at Bridlington and, 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 they, and, they, and they marched down the Great North Road and they arrived in Newark. And this is how important Newark was. Of her four and a half thousand soldiers, she left half of them, or just actually a little bit under half of them, in Newark to defend Newark. So when the Roundheads came back for siege number two, Newark was ready for them. But in between sieges one and two, Newark weren't just sort of sitting on their hands or twiddling their thumbs. No, they had a go at Nottingham, the most dangerous and troublesome of all the nearby Roundhead towns. Leading the attack on Nottingham was a German mercenary called Baron Dona, who got blown to bits by a cannon attacking Nottingham. Well, the Cavaliers picked up what was left of him, took him back to Newark and buried him in Newark. And you can still see his grave today. It's in the garden of Mary Magdalene's church. Siege number two took place almost exactly a year after siege number one in February 1644. Siege number two lasted a month this time. 7,000 soldiers marched against Newark. That's 1,000 soldiers more than the first siege, and they were led by a tough Scottish soldier called John Meldrum. They brought about 13 cannons with them, and they surrounded Newark. And then between the hours of 12 midnight and 1 in the morning, the cannons roared, and these roundheads had put the cannons near enough to hit Newark. A cannonball actually hit the church spire and sort of smashed a chunk out of it. And the roundheads didn't just fire cannonballs. They also shot these flying bombs made out of pottery and packed with gunpowder called Granados. Granados were designed to burn buildings down. There's a sort of funny story associated with that. Well, I say funny, an unusual story. Not funny ha-ha, just unusual. There was a man living in Newark at the time called Hercules Clay. People had better names back in the Civil War. Hercules Clay had three dreams during the Second Siege. He dreamed that his house was hit by a granado and, and burned down, and this bit isn't very nice, roasted him and his family alive. He believed very, very strongly that these dreams came from God. And do you know what he did? He moved his family out of the house. And guess what happened next? A granado actually did hit his house and burn his house to the ground. And he was saved because of his dreams. Let's get back to the fighting. These roundheads had come to fight. They were pretty good at what they did. And Newark would have been captured if they didn't have any help from outside. But fortunately for the people of Newark, the governor of Newark, a man called Richard Willis, had a very, very important friend. And that friend was a member of the royal family. And his name was Prince Rupert of the Rhine, nephew to King Charles I and his best soldier. Prince Rupert was miles away at that point, somewhere near the Welsh border, but he got orders from the king, his uncle, to go as quickly as possible and rescue Newark. And that's what he did. He, he travelled from Chester all the way to Newark in record time, stopping off at towns that were cavalier and just collecting more and more soldiers. So by the time he got to Newark, he had 6,000 men with him. He also probably had a dog as well. He's, 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 anybody who knows anything about Prince Rupert knows that he never went anywhere without his pet dog, this enormous, terrifying poodle called Boy, that was so terrifying that the Roundheads actually believed that the poodle was a monster, a demon, a witch's familiar, possessed by the devil. Well, Rupert and his dog completely took the Roundheads by surprise. They launched a, an extraordinary cavalry charge from Beacon Hill and absolutely annihilated the Roundheads and sort of chased them over the river. And then the Roundheads surrendered. And, and, and Rupert was actually really nice once he'd won the battle. He, he let them go. Can you believe that? 
Rupert let his enemies go, but not before he took all of their weapons off them and gave them to the defenders of Newark. 2-0 to Newark. Unfortunately, this was about as good as it gets for the Cavaliers and the supporters of King Charles I. And the Royalists started to lose the war from this point on. In between sieges two and three, the Roundheads reorganised themselves. A Roundhead you might have heard of, Oliver Cromwell, and his soldier friend and commanding officer, a man called Sir Thomas Fairfax, took control of the Roundhead army, and they retrained it, and they called it the New Model Army. And it was unbeatable. The King and Prince Rupert of the Rhine fought the Roundheads in a battle called Naseby, and in less than three hours, Oliver Cromwell, Sir Thomas Fairfax, and the New Model Army absolutely cleaned the floor, thrashed and destroyed the Cavalier Army. The King and Prince Rupert were lucky to get away. The Cavaliers carried on fighting. Why? Because their king wanted them to. And they were loyal to their king, even if they knew that they couldn't win the war. But the King and Prince Rupert fell out. The king was looking for people to blame for his defeats, and poor old Rupert got the blame. The king called him some things you should never really call a soldier. He called him a traitor and a coward. He wanted Rupert to leave the country as a punishment. Now, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because Rupert and the king had a massive stand-up row about their disagreement in Newark. The king was moving around the country, and he just happened to be in Newark at the time, staying in the governor's residence. And Rupert was in Oxford. Rupert, with about 200 armed men, left Oxford, rode through Northamptonshire, Leicestershire, and Nottinghamshire, and rode into Newark and interrupted the king in Newark while he was having his dinner in the governor's house, and they had a massive stand-up row. They patched up their differences after Rupert was put on trial for treason, and being a coward. And he was found not guilty of being um, a, a traitor or being a coward, but he was still pretty angry. And he left Newark in a bit of a huff. And then it is said the king broke down and wept because of all of the stress this argument had caused him with what used to be his favourite soldier and his favourite nephew. An interesting detail you might like to know is the building that this argument took place in is still there in Newark. And you'll never guess what it is. It's a Greg's, a Greg's where you get your sausage rolls. That's where the king sat and argued with Prince Rupert. Amazing. Greg's. Well, the Cavaliers are in a bit of a strange position in that the war could not be won, but the king had not yet surrendered to Parliament. And so Cavaliers had a choice. They could either change sides, clear off out of the country, or fight onwards, knowing that they were probably going to die or get captured. And guess what Newark did? They fought on. To the death, if need be. In fact, their motto was trust in God and sally forth, which is a posh way of saying fight to the death and trust in God for the result. This brings us to the sad and depressing story of the longest of the three sieges and the most miserable, Siege 3. Before Siege 3, Newark was about as defensible as it could have been. It had more soldiers than it ever had. It had better siege defences, and it had two sconces. A what? A sconce. What's a sconce? Well, a sconce is a star-shaped earthen fort. That is a fort made of mud that you could probably stick about 150 people in that supports the main fortifications. And even though a sconce is made of mud, it's still pretty tough and actually can stop a cannonball more effectively than a stone wall. Newark had two big sconces like this called the King's Sconce and the Queen's Sconce. And the Queen's Sconce is actually still there. You can go and visit it at Sconce Park in Newark and actually play on the sconce that used to be filled with Cavalier soldiers. Newark was surrounded by 17,000 soldiers for the Third Siege. These soldiers had come from all over the country. There were soldiers from London, and there were soldiers that had marched as far as from Scotland to surround Newark. If you want to see how fierce the fighting is and you're in Newark Castle, go down to the towpath underneath what they call the Curtain Wall and you can see literally hundreds of cannonball marks in the wall made by the Scottish Roundheads who were the other side of the River Trent and were blasting into the castle wall trying to bring the castle down. They didn't bring it down because like the people of Newark, the castle is rock hard, literally. 
As I said a few moments ago, the third siege lasted six months, and it was very, very tough to live in Newark during those times. Being completely surrounded by your enemies meant that the Roundheads could cut off supplies coming into Newark, so that meant that food was scarce. So people had to be very, very inventive about what they ate, and ate things we wouldn't even consider eating. Some of the soldiers defending Newark ate their horses. One person that we know of, and there were probably more, ate his dog. And then there was the money. You know, there was the chance that you might run out of money. So the people of Newark had to create their own money. And they did this in the castle. They did it using silver that had been stolen from Leicester. Sorry, Leicester. It was a long time ago. And what they did was they took the silver, they melted it down into sheets, and they cut coins out of it. But they couldn't waste any of the silver, so they didn't cut round coins, because if you cut lots and lots of circles out of a sheet of silver, the space in between the circles, which is wasteful, they cut diamond-shaped coins, and we call these coins siege pieces. The other big problem faced by the defenders of Newark was the winter. All three sieges took place in appalling winters, and the third siege was the worst. It was freezing. But that wasn't the worst thing that the people of Newark had to put up with. The worst thing was disease. Now, there were two diseases that afflicted the people of Newark. The first was typhus. We don't get typhus anymore these days. Typhus is caused by too many people living packed together in too little accommodation and housing and people not washing properly. The other disease was the dreaded plague. Yes, the plague broke out in Newark. And between the typhus outbreak and the plague outbreak, one in seven people living in Newark at the time died of one of these two diseases. That's 1,000 people out of a population of around 7,000 people. Newark probably really would have fought to the death had it not been for the fact that King Charles I was captured on the 6th of May in the nearby town of Southwell by the Scottish Roundheads. And the Scottish Roundheads persuaded King Charles I to order Newark to surrender. So on the 8th of May, 1646, after a six-month siege and four years of spectacular and grueling fighting and enduring all sorts of horrible hardships, the people of Newark surrendered to the Roundheads. Now, what the Roundheads would normally do when a town surrenders to them is they would go in and they would destroy anything that they didn't like. They would destroy the castle, they would destroy the sconce, they would go into the lovely Anglican at St Mary Magdalene's church and they would smash it to bits because they were Puritans and they didn't like fancy churches. But they didn't do that with Newark. Apart from blowing up one keg of gunpowder in the castle and, you know, smashing a few stained glass windows and a baptismal font in St Mary's church, they pretty much left Newark alone, including the Queen's sconce. And the reason that they did that was because the plague was in Newark. And that's what's special about Newark. Newark has a lot of buildings and fortifications from the Civil War that wouldn't normally have survived had not the plague kept the Roundheads out of Newark. And that, my friends, is the story of the three sieges of Newark. Thank you for listening.